There's another very um, interesting uh, law that uh, Moses talks about, and that is a woman was to be, um, I think, seven days after giving birth to a male child, she was unclean, whereas when she gave birth to a female child, she was unclean, I think, for double that period. Yes. Why is that? And also a man had to stay away from her. I think uh, if I stand, I stand to be corrected, but I think when it was a male, at least 33 days, and double that if it was a female. Well, now, why is that? Well, there are some very interesting reasons. I, I'm sure there are others uh, that I might not be aware of, but it is quite common that when a woman gives birth to a female child, then the postnatal blood flow is much longer than when she gives birth to a male child. It just seems to be a phenomenon. Many women have recorded this, that when they've had their daughters, the blood flow continued for a much longer period than when they had sons. Now, the exact reason for this is, is hard to discern. I believe it probably has something to do with the hormones and the presence in, in the fetus of the hormone testosterone, which is the male hormone. Now, the hormone testosterone in mammals is very, very important. It determines uh, the whole secretion cycle. For example, if, if testosterone in mammals is present in an early stage, even in that uh, pre- or just postnatal stage, then the whole hormone cycle in the control gland, the hypothalamus and the pituitary, is switched to the regular release of hormones. In the absence of that hormone, you have cyclic release. So a female child would not have testosterone and would develop cyclic release. That's why women go through monthly cycles and men don't go through the monthly cycle. So that might have something to do with it. Now, I found another one that's uh, intrigued me over the years as well, and that is a house that had mildew in it had to be destroyed. What would be the basis of that? Well, that's, that's a very fascinating one today. You know, people live in mildewed houses all over the world, and they wonder why they have so many problems. Uh, today we know that mildew, it's, it's a fungus, and it produces spores. And we call the toxins associated with these products, we call them mycotoxins. And these mycotoxins are highly carcinogenic, number one. They can produce, in other words, cancer types, uh, allergens. They are very debilitating, and you cannot get rid of them unless you destroy the fungus. So in the Bible, if there were patches of this and you treated it and it went away, then you were allowed to stay in the house. But if you could not get rid of it, you had to destroy the house. It's unfit for occupation. Today, those laws don't exist, and people walk around with, uh, with lung diseases and all the problems associated with mycotoxins. It's much better to get rid of that house, yes. Yes, yeah, pretty drastic action in, in Bible times. Destroy your house. Yes, and, and restore your health. Yes. A another one that um, has um, always intrigued me, too, in, uh, in Moses' writing is the fact that the Bible says we ought not to mix together uh, different fabrics like wool and cotton. What would be the basis for that, do you think? Well, personally, I don't know the exact reasons for why the Bible says that. Although today in society you have many uh, people that, that actually follow that rule and they believe that it disturbs the, the electric field. When you combine certain components, the electric field is disturbed, and many people believe that this has something to do with disease as well. Also, electric fields produced by other components in the environment, many people believe that you can, can change this by magnetism, and they swear by it. Now, whether there's any real basis in it or not, I would not be prepared to put my head on a block, but maybe there is something like that. Maybe we are uh, on the fringes of the science of understanding that there might even be sense in laws like those regarding your health. Of course, one of the um, laws that 
impacts upon life in the 21st century is the uh, law against taking another woman when you're married to uh, one wife and the, the laws against licentiousness. What, what do you think would be the basis for that? Well, once again, there's some, some very interesting findings that have been uh, published on this very issue. People that are monogamous have a, a higher health record than people that are not monogamous. Yeah, monogamous means only having one partner, one partner at a yes. time. Yes. And uh, that virus, for example, that I spoke about that sits in the cervix that causes uh, uh, virulent cancers related to the herpes virus, that particular virus will stay latent, and if exposed to one sperm type, it will not become active readily. If exposed to multiple sperm types, it will become active. So people that are, have multiple partners are in a higher risk cancer for cervical cancer, for example, plus all the other possible diseases that uh, are venereal. So there are good reasons for sticking to one partner. In fact, if people were to stick to one partner, if monogamy was the name of the game, then AIDS would not have the impact that it has today. What about the impact that this has on, say, the teenage, the teenage girl who um, is having multiple partners? Um, does that have a, also a, a very bad physiological effect upon Absolutely. the child? Absolutely, and juvenile cervical cancer is rampant. It's one of the big killers in the world today. And this is simply because of this modern idea that it doesn't make any difference. It does make a difference. Now, something else that um, the Bible is very clear on, and that is not being married to f family members that are too close. Yes. Now, this raises a very interesting question in relationship to Adam and Eve and their descendants and who they married. Because obviously Adam and Eve's children must have married one another. Absolutely. Well, how does that impact upon what the Bible talks about, not marrying someone of close family? Well, if, let's go back to Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve were created, they were perfect. They were very good. That means they had no genetic abnormalities, none whatsoever. There were no gene faults. And uh, if one of the kin married the kin, they would be marrying into a faultless genome, no genetic errors. So there's no accumulation of any one particular aspect that could go wrong. Now, as time progressed and uh, the genes were not maintained in their perfect condition after the fall, obviously you needed something like the tree of life to keep them in perfect condition. Mm -hmm. So genetic errors would accumulate over time. And genetic errors, because of dominance and recessiveness, can be eliminated or reduced by marrying into groups that are further apart in terms of relationship. So at one particular time then, it would have become necessary to say, all right, now genetic aberrations have accumulated to the extent where it is necessary that closely related siblings should not intermarry. So find your partner further apart so that that particular aberration won't be present. Now, mutations tend to be recessive. So in that way, the dominant one would be the normal one and the recessive one uh, would be the abnormal one and wouldn't come out in, in the offspring. Whereas if you intermarried, then they would accumulate. And so in the beginning, God said, it's fine. And then at a particular point, he said, from now on, you will no longer do that. And that is the reason. Yes, well, because those laws, as recorded in Leviticus, are very, very similar to the laws that govern uh, those of us who perform marriages. They're the laws that are given to us as to uh, you know, the relationships that are forbidden, which is very interesting considering yes. that it comes to us from the Bible. You know, we, we find it in modern breeding. If you do line breeding and you're breeding towards a particular feature, let's say you want to breed a dog that is short and 
and long, then you have to use interbreeding in order to get there. But you get to the point where the accumulated genome is no longer viable and those animals are diseased. And the only way to continue breeding is to backbreed, is to bring in wild type genes and mix them in again and then you can continue with the process. So the same would apply here in the human mm -hmm. factor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people often ask me, you know, where do we get the races from? Well, obviously what has happened, you've had a certain group interbreeding and the genes, let's say for the other races, are removed by selection from that particular category. The only way to get that gene back is to backbreed. Yeah. So if a black person marries a white person, then all the genes of that entire variety are back in, in the offspring and they can be a mixture of the two, which is the most common, or they could be totally black, or they could be white with blue eyes and blonde hair because the whole genetic variety is there again. Mm. But Adam and Eve must have had the full complement. Yeah. Just one other thing, Just uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, and that is regarding AIDS impacting our society in a horrific way today. What comment would you make about AIDS in relationship to the Bible? Well, the Bible is very clear on what relationship between a man and a woman should be like and what relationship should be generally. Now, what is the modern, modern way of fighting AIDS? The modern way is prevention of AIDS through, for example, condoms. But prevention of AIDS is not addressed at the level of morality, never. It is, it is not uh, socially acceptable to address it at that level. If monogamy, as I said, was reintroduced, then AIDS could not spread. It's because of polygamy and because of licentiousness that AIDS is spreading. I personally don't believe that a condom is a deterrent for AIDS. It might limit it to extent, but it certainly doesn't stop it, which is being proved in society today, but monogamy would stop it. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor, for being with us today. Most interesting insights into some of the uh, parts of the Bible, I guess, that we don't always have the opportunity of having someone to help us to answer for. Once again, thank you for joining us today. The more I study, the more you study, the more will be confirmed the wonderful inspiration and uh, the fact that God has given to us a wonderful book in the Bible. I hope to uh, see you again next time. And in the meantime, let me encourage you to study and to read God's word daily. God bless you.